Okay, I just want to let a couple of you know, in case you need a two, uh, next year's calendar for 23, there's a couple sitting on the table back there. Just feel free to take them. I can't believe how many calendars have already arrived at my house for... Well, here we are on the grounds of this historic church on 24 July. 2022, where the great Pastor Katie Daly's sermon is based on Luke 11, 1 through 13. The name of her sermon is Lord, Teach Us to Pray. We hope to see you in church, and we're praying that you come. And if you're not in church, thank you so much for joining us online. God bless, and we'll see you in church. Good morning and welcome to our summertime worship and boy is it feeling like summertime in this building. Whoa! I think the devil is saying, hey, how about sending the weather back down to me again? We've had enough of this heat wave. So on this, this 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time, we gather today and our gospel reading for the day is a much known prayer by so many of us. We say it and never think of the words as we say it. So good morning. Welcome to First United Church of Christ in Richmond. We are a church that is a come as you are church. Whatever you are, whoever you may be, whether you are a committed Christian or somebody just kind of learning the ropes, you are welcome here. And we believe that God is still speaking. And for some who have just wandered in today, I think maybe God was just speaking to your heart that said, hey, it's maybe time to drop in at church. So welcome as we begin our worship. And remember, it matters not where your faith journey has been or if it's not been at all. You are definitely welcome here at First United Church of Christ in Richmond. So as we gather, let us begin with a story, just a quick story. A pastor's car broke down in a remote area. There were no buildings around except for a small tavern. The preacher went into the bar to call for road service, and to his surprise, he found his old friend Hank. Hank was shabbily dressed and sitting at the bar, and he said, Hank, what happened to you? And Hank described all his problems and bad investments and asked for the pastor's advice. The pastor said, go home, open the Bible, to a page at random and put your finger on the page. I'm sure God will give you the answer. When the pastor returned the next year, he saw Hank and, wow, he was much better dressed and apparently doing very well. So he said to him, did my advice work? And Hank answered, it sure did. I opened my Bible, just like you said, put my finger down on the page, and there was the answer. Chapter 11. <laughs> so now for our ringing of the bell and our lighting of the candle. And for those of you at home, I hope you have a candle in your worship space. As we light the candle, to be reminded that Christ is the light of the word, world, and we are Christ's light in the world. And now for our music moment, I'm going to invite Christ to come forward. Good morning. Well, you may have heard me play a little hymn over there, a very famous one. I wish Steve was here. He requested called Blessed Assurance. And blessed assured, my papers are going to fly away here. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hair of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long, which is the first verse to blessed assurance. So here's your music minute. Tune composer, Phoebe Palmer Knapp, born 1839 to died 1908, played a melody to Fanny Crosby and asked, 
what does the melody say to you? And Crosby replied that the tune said, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, and proceeded to recite the entire first stanza of the now famous hymn. Knapp was one of several tune writers that worked with Fanny Crosby. It was not unusual uh, for one of her texts to be inspired by a pre-existing tune. Knapp was one of the composers of more than 500 gospel hymns and tunes. So that's who the composer was. How about Fanny Crosby? It's very interesting. 1820 to 1915, she was blind at the age of six weeks, was a lifelong Methodist who began composing hymns at age six. She became a student of the New York Institute of the Blind at age 15 and joined the faculty of the Institute at 22, teaching rhetoric and history. In 1885, Crosby married someone, uh, if I can say his name, Alexander Van Alstein, also a student at the Institute and later a member of the faculty. He was a fine musician and, like Fanny, a lover of literature. Okay, an author of more than 8,000 gospel hymn texts, she drew her inspiration from her own faith. Crosby published under several names. Her hymn texts were staples of the music of the most prominent gospel songs of her day. And there's your music minute. Thank you. Are you going to sing it? I want them to stay. I'm not going to sing it. Okay. I think Price was going at a pace faster than I even talk when I'm excited. So, for our call to worship, and it's based on Psalm 85. Just so those of you who are following the Psalms for the summer, um, if you're reading a Psalm of Day, we're not up to 85 yet. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Together? The Lord. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him. And please stand if you're able for Shine Jesus Shine. Glory, place, spirit, place. 
and our prayer of confession together. Lord God, so often we declare that you are not our God. Through our selfish thoughts, our empty prayers, and our destructive habits, we declare that we are in fact in charge. Forgive us when we try to be you instead of trying to be your disciples. Restore us to your ways and lead us in the path of everlasting life. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And our assurance of pardon is from the book of Romans, Paul's book to the Roman community. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and imperfect and perfect to God. Believe the promise of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In our prayer for illumination together, holy, in your Holy Spirit, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that with the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know the hope to which Christ has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance among us, and the greatness of his power for those who believe. Amen. And now I invite Lucia to come forward for our first reading, which is from Genesis. Good morning. morning. This is uh, Genesis 18, verse 18, chapters 20 through 32. Then the Lord said, How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city, Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just. And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again he spoke to him, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. 
And he answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. And he answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Great, Lucian. So good to see her again, as she hasn't been able to get here as often as before. And now we will have a responsorial psalm that is done by Christine Hench. And then following it, we will have the same song, but we will play it on a YouTube video so that you can actually hear it, because we all know what you hear in song stays long. I know everybody learned A, B, C, D, E, F, so that's why we're doing it. Good morning. Uh, we'll read this psalm responsively. Uh, your response is, Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. Taken from Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with all my heart, for you have heard the words of my mouth. In the presence of the angels, I will sing your praise. I will worship at your holy temple and give thanks to your name. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. Because of your kindness and your truth, for you have made great above all things your name and your promise. When I called you, to ans you answered me. You built up strength within me. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. The Lord is exalted, yet the lowly he sees, and the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk amid distress, you preserve me. Against the anger of my enemies, you raise your hand. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. Your right hand saves me. The Lord will com complete what he has done for me. Your kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your hands. Lord, on the day I called for help, you answered me. God of hope and mercy, you promise to hear us when we pray to you. Confident of that promise, we bring before you our joys and our concerns, our hopes and our fears. We pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And I don't know if we need that other microphone in order to hear the song. You have it. Okay, go for it.
Our second reading comes from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 19. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the eternal spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. Well, somehow the PowerPoint got lost, but that's okay, we have time now. Our gospel reading, please stand if you are able. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not subject us to the final test. And he said to them, suppose you or one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children and I have already gone to bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give the visitor the loaves because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, 
and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you would ask a hand of his son to be given to a snake or for a fish? Or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If then you who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Be seated. That is not the usual version of the Our Father that we are accustomed to. It's a little bit briefer, but it says the important parts of that prayer. And so we know that as Jesus' messages have been unfolding over these last couple of weeks, it's been a thing of come and see, go and do, listen and wait. And now we hear the disciples saying, teach us how to pray. I think we need to know how to do each of them at whatever time in life we need them. We need to know how to prioritize. Teach us to pray, the disciples asked Jesus. It's the only time in scripture that the disciples made a direct request of Jesus to teach them anything. And we should not be surprised they wanted Jesus to teach them to pray since Luke's Gospel shows Jesus at prayer before every major event in his ministry. According to Luke, Jesus prays before calling the disciples. He prays before the transfiguration. And he prays before the confession of Peter. And even before he reveals that he will suffer and die. And on the night before, his arrest in the garden, he also prayed. But according to Luke, Jesus also prayed when he hung on the cross. And two of the sentences that he has recorded in the gospel text of Luke are in the form of prayer. Teach us to pray is basically saying, it's not just a performance by somebody else, it's not just something that I listen to, but it's something that has to come from my heart. The very beginning of the prayer, Father. It establishes that there is some kind of intimacy between Jesus and the Father. And we know that it's that intimacy and that knowing of the Father being behind him, the wind behind his wings, that that's what kept Jesus on focus for that ministry to go up to Jerusalem to be crucified and die for us. In Lucia's first reading, don't you love the way Abraham is basically making a bargain back and forth with God? How about this? How about this? How about this? Oh. It is that bargaining. It's so Jewish in nature. And I think that was actually a prayer. And how many of us have had that kind of prayer? Oh, God, if only you would take this away from me, I will blah, 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 blah. If only you will heal my son or daughter, I will blah, 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 blah. We make all these promises in prayer as we go forth when we struggle. And God hears us. God hears every one of our prayers, and sometimes we don't feel like we're ever getting an answer because the human nature is we always want what we want, not always what God wants for us. So we know that in that Lord's Prayer, when we dare to say it, and I say dare, which is what I usually say before we actually do say it, because it is such an important prayer when it is said from our heart. Father, we address the Almighty in an intimate term. And Jesus actually also used Abba, which was Daddy. So we know that they had a connection. There was a relationship 
between the Father and the Son, and we need to have a relationship between the Father, the Son, and us. That establishes the intimacy of our relationship. And yes, Luke's version is a little bit short, but it's something that is said at just about every Christian church during public worship. Every single one of the Christian churches will say the Lord's Prayer. And it's that parable that follows that kind of raises the questions. What's with that guy knocking at the door in the middle of the night asking for three loaves of bread? Jesus seems to suggest in that that the secret to prayer is persistence, our conditional and continual knocking on the door. It's Jesus who does the knocking on the door of our heart. Does God answer prayers on behalf of the squeaky wheel? I don't think so. God wants our hearts to be in all of the prayer. I think the first thing we need to remember about this prayer in Luke is the word Father. It unlocks the parable. It is found as the very first word here. Jesus teaches us to call on God as Father. That is the startling word that actually opens up the heart of the person praying to God in an intimate yet respectful way. When we call God Father or Abba or Daddy, it, it, it is a word that suggests a very close relationship. But we are not on the same level as God. It is a close relationship. It's not a buddy-to-buddy -buddy relationship. Father demands respect. And in this first century, for Jesus to use even the term Father instead of Yahweh, or Abba for Daddy, it was strange to them. Israel had pictured God as the father of Israel, that group of people, and only that group of people. That was kind of a me, mine, it's ours kind of thing. But we know in the prayer, every pronoun that is used in the prayer of the Our Father is about community. It's not, my father, grant me what is mine. It's about our father. It's those plural pronouns that are used in that prayer. So Jesus teaches that our Heavenly Father looks out for his children and provides everything that they need. Father in heaven. What is this heaven thing? That's where the kingdom of God is. And give us this day. Do you think they're asking for a loaf of bread? No. They're saying, this day, Father, I need you. I need you within my heart. That's the provision that I need for this day. I need to feel the closeness. I need to feel the intimacy. I need to connect with you. That's our daily bread. It's not just bread on the table. As a child, you learned, yes, bread on the table. We're going to get enough bread for the day, the manna in the desert. No, it's about, I need enough of you, God, within me to make me a better person. So in this prayer, we're asking God to provide everything that we need. Everything that we need. Not our wants, but everything that we need. And so the children of the Father they don't have to pound on the door to get the Father's attention. All they need to do is whisper, Father. But the second great truth that's in that prayer is that pronoun, our. You are a child of God. Jesus taught us that. But you are not an only child, any more than the Israelites were the only children of God. Notice that this prayer assumes a community at prayer. 
And thus, it's all of us in relationship to one another. Jesus did not say, my father, give me my daily bread. Always the plural, our, we, us. So to pray as Jesus taught is to recognize that we are placed in a community where we relate to God. If God is our Father, then we must recognize that we share the family of faith with many, many, many brothers and sisters who call on him also. And so our praying is not the selfish wish list of a spoiled child who wants the parent to dote on him or her and to serve the child's every whim. No, it's not that at all. And it's not like Janis Joplin, who sang back in, uh, I don't know, maybe somebody else out there probably knows, I think the 70s. She sang a song, and one of the verses was, Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. I worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Well, technically, that might be a prayer, but it certainly is not a good one. Her song, which always was meant to be taken more as a parody than a prayer, reveals the self-centeredness to which prayer can go when it is removed from the context of the community. We become very selfish. It's about me and mine. Jesus taught us that prayer is an act of adoration, of submission, of trust, and an act of worship. And in all of these dimensions, prayer is offered to God with the knowledge that I am connected. I am connected to God through the life and faith and actions of my local church community as it teaches and practices and gathers week after week to pray together. As a group of people, we are Sinners Anonymous who gather on Sunday morning. No one of us, no one of us is without sin. So we praise as we say that prayer, and we have purpose, and we seek protection that is both physical and spiritual as we pray that prayer. And the people said, And as we gather our, salt, our thoughts on all the people who need our prayer, let us remember also the thanksgivings. We have Sandy Knoll who has surgery lately and she's looking and doing wonderfully. Everything is good in her life. Um, Bill Wagner is doing good, he's at home and has his daughter helping him out. And Lucia is back with us today, thank you God. And as we gather our prayers, we boldly ask that your Holy Spirit come and be present in our church today, transforming and renewing our lives, we pray. We pray for grandparents and all of the elderly, we pray. We pray that we might be Christ's hands and eyes and ears to one another this week, seeking the world through your son's eyes. We pray. And let us look for opportunities this week to heal, to affirm, to guide, to teach, and to love. We pray. We pray for our nation and our world. We pray that your spirit will transform our world so that nations at war can become nations at peace. We pray. 
We pray for those who are hungry, that they may eat their fill, that those who are afraid may be comforted and confident, we pray. Let us see things through Christ's eyes and be ambassadors of your will and your word, we pray. And for farmers and those who depend on the land for their livelihood, for weather that promotes healthy crops across the planet, we pray. Gracious God, like our ancestors in faith, we lift our hearts and voices to you in prayer. We call upon your mercy and compassion, remembering that you love and care for us. We pray in the name of your beloved son, Jesus, who told us to ask, seek, knock, with persistence, and together we dare to pray. Our who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I just want to offer thanksgiving for all of those who support the church and our mission activities. And thank you, too, for those who have been bringing in school supplies. We've got a basket full already, and they will be distributed to the children of the Richmond school system. So remembering that all that we have and all that we are, our treasure, our prayers, in the fullness of our lives is a gift from God entrusted to our care for only a season. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do through our in-person and online community of faith. Our prayer of dedication. For your glory. We bring our gifts to you today. May they be transformed into ministry and mission for the world. We also bring before you the gifts of our lives. May our actions this week. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, the good news of the gospel is clear. God has saved us for a new life. Let us go forth in the knowledge of God's saving love that we might offer our lives as a continual thank offering, responding to what God has done for us. And please stand for the summons. <laughs>
knowing that you are loved by God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The service has ended. Let the service begin. Thank you for tuning in, everyone, on this glorious Father's Day in 2022. This church has been here a long time. Let's keep it going. God bless, and see you in church.